we've tried everything. There's nothing more that we can do. I heard those words, but between my organs shutting down and the unbearable pain, I didn't really know what my doctors meant until my family came into the room to say their final goodbyes and a priest read me my last rites. I was 25 years old. Six months earlier, I was a healthy former college athlete and a medical student trained to become an oncologist in memory of my mom who had died just a few years before from cancer when I became suddenly ill with a rare and deadly illness called Castleman disease, where my immune system attacks and shuts down my vital organs for an unknown cause. It's about as common as ALS, and most patients with my subtype of Castleman disease die within a few years of diagnosis. In a last-ditch effort to save my life, my doctors gave me a combination of seven chemotherapies. Somehow, I survived. But I would go on to relapse and nearly die four more times. And I would not be alive today if not for a discovery that saved my life and has the potential to save your lives and the lives of those that you love. Over the course of the next six months after my diagnosis, I spent months and months in the ICU. And you can see this photograph here. I just gotten discharged, and uh, you can see I've got a big belly from the liver and the kidney failure. I've lost all of my hair from the chemotherapy. And this picture is from a few years before when I played college football at Georgetown. I was a quarterback there, and I always say this is the worst before and after picture of all time. <laughs> but if we could flip the order, it could be this great advertisement for muscle milk or shake weight. Um, but unfortunately, the pictures are in the wrong order. I did take a picture every week for the next eight weeks, and you can see my hair starting to grow back. You can see the fluid starting to go away um, as the chemotherapy kicked in, and I got better uh, from this horrible disease. When I got out of the hospital, two things kept me going. Uh, the first is in this picture. It's my, my girlfriend at the time, Caitlin, the love of my life. I dreamed of having a family one day with her. She gave me the support that I needed. And the second is actually also in this picture, and that is an experimental drug that's getting pumped into my port uh, during this, this particular photograph, a drug that was undergoing a clinical trial for Castleman disease and we hoped could maybe keep me alive and save my life. Unfortunately, about one year later, I was able to go back to medical school, make more progress at Penn before I relapsed and nearly died now for the fourth time. What was so difficult about this relapse is that I was now relapsing on the only drug in development for my disease. There were no more promising leads, and my doctor explained to me that the chemotherapy was going to stop working and I was eventually going to die from this disease. After uh, my doctor explained that to me, I turned to my dad, my sisters, and to Caitlin, and I promised them, I said, I'm gonna dedicate the rest of my life, however long that may be, to trying to find a treatment for this disease. And as Daniel shared, I wrote a book about my journey called Chasing My Cure, and this is a particularly important moment in my life, so I wanna share a passage from it. And that's that this is the moment when I realized that I could no longer hope that someone somewhere could find a drug that could save my life. I realized that hope cannot be a passive concept. It's a choice and a force. Hoping for something takes more than casting out a wish to the universe and waiting for it to occur. Hope should inspire action. And when it does inspire action in health and in medicine, it can be, uh, that hope can become a reality beyond your wildest dreams. And so for me, I went from being this hopeful medical student to now being on a mission to try to turn my hope into action. So the first thing I did was try to try to get a sense for what was known about Castleman disease. Where was the field at this time? And I learned that there was no diagnostic criteria, no treatment guidelines, no progress had been made for this disease. The last drug target was discovered 25 years ago. There was no research community, no patient community. It was absolutely frightening. So the first thing we did was to um, launch an organization called the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. And, and I found some laboratory space at Penn. No one was doing Castleman's research at Penn, but a pulmonologist gave me some space in her lab. And so uh, as we set out on a mission to advance research for Castleman's, we knew that we couldn't follow the typical approach. You know, this disease had been around for decades and no one had figured out anything about it. So we wanted to take it on in two different ways. So first is that we knew that we couldn't just raise money and hope the right researcher would apply for the right project at the right time. If we wanted to really drive forward progress, we would need to crowdsource from the entire community of patients, physicians, and researchers to determine what is the most powerful and important study and then go recruit the best researchers 
researchers from outside of the field to actually do the work. And secondly, we knew that the only chance that I had at survival would be to identify an existing drug that could be repurposed for me. Now, we knew that was possible because many diseases share the same underlying mechanisms and can therefore be treated with the same drug. And so as I looked at, the, at my neighborhood pharmacy shelf, my dream, my hope, my prayer was that a drug could be sitting on that shelf that could maybe save my life and save other patients with my disease. And of course, it was my, my only chance at survival. Now, this concept of repurposing isn't just specific to medicine. Um, the first telephone was actually meant to be a hearing aid. Uh, the first radios were meant for ship-to-ship -ship communication. We all know how they're used now. And finally, the first computer was intended for tracking results from the U.S. Census. Now, in medicine, there are also some really good examples of repurposing. So thalidomide went from being a birth defect causing morning sickness drug to being a life-saving multiple myeloma drug. Viagra went from its well-known use uh, to also being a life-saving drug for a rare pediatric pulmonary condition. And uh, tocilizumab went from being a Castleman disease drug that was developed in Japan to being the first drug that you get if you're admitted to the ICU with COVID-19. So with all this in mind, um, I, I went back to medical school, was able to, to graduate from med school. It's a picture of Caitlin and I on my graduation day from Penn. I started business school at Warden and uh, unfortunately um, relapsed and, and I nearly died for the fifth time. And what was so tough about this relapse was that I was receiving weekly chemotherapy in the hopes that it would keep me in remission. And even the weekly chemotherapy couldn't stop a relapse. So I got the same combination of seven chemotherapies, um, uh, but I knew that I wouldn't make it to Caitlin and I's wedding day. We had just gotten engaged um, unless I could find a drug that could, could save my life. And so um, I, I got out of the hospital after getting chemo and I, and I went to work and um, performed a series of studies. So first, a number of cytokine panels on the blood samples I'd been storing on myself in the weeks leading up to the relapse. Um, also uh, performed this broad serum proteomics panel using somalogic and did uh, in-depth flow cytometry of my immune cells. And, and, I, and I got these signals about things that were happening in my immune system. System. And the question was, is there some sort of final common path that could explain um, what I was observing? And uh, I ran pathway analyses in the proteomics data, and it predicted that the mTOR signaling pathway could be involved in my particular disease. Now, mTOR is really important for T cell activation and VEGF production, um, so it kind of fit the bill. Um, and uh, so we wanted to confirm that. So I went to um, my lymph node tissue, um, lymph node being the home base of your immune system, and um, stained some normal lymph nodes to see if there's how much mTOR was active in my lymph nodes. So first we looked at some normals. Um, mTOR, uh, when positive, would stain brown, negative is blue. And you can see in a normal lymph node, most of the cells are negative for mTOR. And then we stained my lymph node, and we're just blown away by the tremendous amount of mTOR activation. This is a communication line in the immune system um, that, in this case, was, was clearly in, in, in overdrive. So the best part about mTOR is that uh, there's a great mTOR inhibitor called serolimus or rapamycin. I'm sure many of you in this room may be on it for its anti-aging properties. Um, and, uh, but it was developed over 50 years ago and utilized for kidney transplantation. It had never been used before for Castleman disease. Um, but I had data to suggest that maybe it could be helpful. So I became the first patient ever to be treated with serolimus with my particular disease. Um, and it's been over now over nine years that I've been in remission on this drug. I was able to marry Caitlin, the love of my life. We've had two beautiful children during this remission. Uh, be able to make incredible progress for Castleman disease. The New York Times called this doctor cure thyself, which I think is a bit of an overstatement. I think it should be doctor helping himself a little bit right now and hopefully for a lot longer. Um, but I don't think that that would have fit in the headline. Um, as, as Daniel mentioned earlier, um, you guys should have all gotten a copy of Chasing My Cure, the book I wrote about my journey. Um, and during this remission, um, I also uh, joined the faculty at Penn where I launched a center called the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory, or the CASEL, as we like to refer to ourselves, um, with the goal of unlocking underlying biology of hyperinflammatory diseases and then finding drugs that can be repurposed to treat um, those diseases. Um, over the last eight years, we've discovered nine more drugs that can be repurposed and utilized in new ways for diseases they were not intended for. Um, these are pictures of just a few of the many patients that are alive today because of repurposing purpose drugs. These people are alive and many others because of drugs that they're, the, the, the drug that they're on was not intended for their disease. Um, and I want to tell you about one patient in particular and his journey, um, which has really uh, changed the treatment of a uh, horrible cancer called angiosarcoma. So Michael came to our center in 2016, um, had just been given uh, a, a three-month prognosis um, with his metastatic angiosarcoma. 
chemotherapy wasn't working, um, and we did something really simple. We just looked to see if there was any data anywhere that could suggest any drug could be useful for angiosarcoma. And back in 2013, there was a study that suggested that um, uh, the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway uh, was potentially in, important in angiosarcoma, but now three years had passed by between a paper being published, and here we were three years later, and no one had actually tried a PD-1 inhibitor in this patient. And so, so based on that, um, and the fact that we had no other options. Um, we tested his tumor and it became came back blazingly positive for PDL1. Um, and we decided to treat him as the first patient ever with angiosarcoma to be treated with a PD1 inhibitor. And Michael has been in remission. It'll, it'll actually be seven years next month that he's been in remission on this drug. And now patients all over the world with metastatic angiosarcoma all get PD1 inhibitors. Um, this required no feat of brilliance whatsoever. All we had to do was uncover work that someone else did and actually get the drug into this patient. Um, and amazingly, uh, like I said, it's standard of care all over the world, and there are clinical trials um, that are finishing up that are demonstrating the benefit of this drug. So when COVID emerged, um, our center really leaned into um, centralizing data and then evaluating the most promising treatments for COVID. Um, check out cdcn.org slash corona um, to, to learn more about it. So these experiences, and I should mention in the COVID um, perspective, COVID case, uh, many of us, when we think about COVID repurposing, sometimes we'll think that it wasn't positive or that maybe we didn't find drugs for COVID. But the reality is, is the two drugs that saved the most lives during the pandemic are dexamethasone and tocilizumab, two drugs that were never made for COVID and never intended for it, but have saved literally millions of lives. Um, and the most amazing part is those two drugs were discovered within the first three months of the pandemic. So, so I think repurposing was is incredibly successful for COVID. So this experience, you know, I'm alive here because of a repurposed drug. We've got thousands of patients all over the world that are alive because of drugs that we gave them that weren't meant for their disease. COVID has shown millions of lives can be saved with drugs that were not intended for those diseases. So that, that begs the question, how many cures sit on the pharmacy shelf while patients suffer and the data linking those drugs and disease hide in plain sight? And just to give a bit of perspective, there are about 3,000 FDA-approved drugs that are approved for about 3,000 diseases, but there's another 9,000 diseases that don't have a single FDA-approved therapy. That means one in 10 of you, your children, and your grandchildren either have or will develop a disease without a single approved therapy. And one third of these kids will not survive until kindergarten. So, why is that the case? Well, there's three systemic barriers that prevent drugs from being fully utilized. The first is that no one is responsible for making sure that drugs are utilized for every disease that they can possibly treat. This is a, a quote from Janet Woodcock, and it's so devastating that once a drug becomes approved, incentives begin to go away in terms of figuring out more uses for those drugs. So one problem, no one is responsible for it. Two, there's no centralized database that tracks every drug and every disease that that drug could potentially be utilized for. And three, there are no incentives in place for the over 80% of drugs that are already generic and therefore unable to create a profit motive. So about Four months ago, we launched an organization called Every Cure to try to take on this problem. An organization to unlock the full potential of each and every drug to treat each and every disease possible and save every life possible with existing drugs at your neighborhood CVS. So since launching, um, we've been able to identify a number of amazing partners. I'm gonna share a little bit about how we go about identifying these drug disease links and moving them forward. So, so step one is to identify as many drug disease links as possible. We partnered with a group at UNC uh, and also our team at Penn um, to leverage knowledge graphs, in particular the RoboCop knowledge graph, which pulls together drug diseases and targets from all around, uh, from a variety of different data sources. So first step is the knowledge graph. Second step is accessing proprietary data from companies that are willing to donate and share share their data with us that could potentially link a drug to a disease. And we've got a number of great partners thus far. And the third piece is something I'm really excited about, but we haven't been able to make tons of progress on yet. And that's working directly with big pharmaceutical companies and saying among the 30 drugs that you developed that are now generic, can you tell us the five to 10 other diseases for each one of those drugs that you considered, but you never actually were able to pursue? And I think this is a really exciting opportunity. Um, amazing work is done within big, uh, big pharmaceutical 
pharmaceutical companies in terms of R&D to think about what the other dr uh, diseases are for each drug, but in many cases, no one is ever able to actually pursue um, the use of those drugs in additional disease areas. So we utilize all this information to generate a 36 million cell heat map, 3,000 drugs on one axis, 12,000 diseases on the other axis, so 36 million possibilities, every drug against every disease. And then we tune the algorithm to improve this heat map by utilizing clinical trial results because we actually know that 3,000 drugs work for 3,000 diseases, so you'd like to see that, that the algorithm actually suggests that those approved drugs actually score well. Um, and then we continue to tune the algorithm with, with artificial intelligence. We make the data fully available through every cure data viewer so anyone can access it. I should mention this is a nonprofit organization. And then our team focuses in on those hotspots within the heat map. What are the disease drug links that look the most promising, especially the ones that aren't actually already being pursued um, or that haven't been studied in the past? And so then we work with partners to perform in silico studies to see have individuals with that disease been exposed to that drug? Um, if so, does it look promising? And then we launch clinical trials with partners like Medibol um, who can run decentralized clinical trials. Uh, and give us a sense for whether this drug actually works or, or does not work. And as I said earlier, we're focused on the 3,000 drugs that are already FDA approved. Within two weeks of my discovering serolimus might be helpful, I was on serolimus. Within three weeks of us discovering that PD-1 inhibition might be helpful for Michael, he was on that drug. And so we're talking about identifying drugs that can be useful and rapidly moving forward to make sure that they can actually be tested in people and patients like myself can, can, can benefit. So step four, once we've demonstrated a drug is effective in a clinical trial, and of course this is what we've been doing in the Castleman space, the most important thing is ensuring that the drug is reimbursed and making sure that it's adopted in clinical practice. So patients and physicians are aware that this drug could be utilized. And then not as important, but, um, but certainly still important, is to actually get the FDA to change the label for this particular disease. And I say not as important um, because uh, it's actually quite challenging um, to get a generic drug to have the label change. You have to work with the initial innovator, um, and it isn't clear that it's all that essential when the drug is already generic and it's already widely available, um, all over the world, by the way. Um, so of course, in addition to identifying drugs that will continue to save many lives, this will also help to uh, unlock critical insights into disease biology. L mapping together what we call the pharmacophenome feels like a really essential step for humankind. And so, you know, the, where we are now is 3,000 drugs approved for 3,000 diseases, and what we, what we want to get to is a world where those 3,000 drugs are utilized for the remaining, as many of the remaining 9,000 diseases. And of course, we do not have any belief that every disease is going to be cured with every drug, but we believe that if there's a cure on your pharmacy shelf and you have a horrible disease, we believe that you should be able to access that drug. So we've been able to put together an amazing team of people um, photographed on the screen. Just want to highlight my two co-founders, uh, Grant and Tracy. Grant and I did medical school together at Penn um, and, af and business school as well. And then afterwards, Grant went on to start a couple uh, healthcare startups and then also um, went to work for McKinsey where he did um, drug repurposing, identifying new uses for a specific one drug company at a time. And so a few years ago, we joined together and said, we've got to do this at scale. We can't, um, you know, I can't keep working on just a few diseases and you can't just keep working on a few drugs for different companies. We've really got to, got to change the paradigm here, and, and Tracy's a real expert in clinical trials. So in addition to having a really awesome team, we've also got some really incredible partners um, the, and, and also groups that we hopefully will, will become official partners in the near term. Um, this, is, this requires all hands on deck. Um, this is, uh, we're, we're creating an entirely new path for saving lives, and we would be just delighted to add, to add every organization you can think of to this list. So um, President Clinton read my book a couple years ago. He actually reached out to me on the day before April Fool's uh, two years ago, so I was pretty sure when I heard that call with that deep Arkansas accent that it wasn't actually President Clinton, but it turned out it was. Um, he was really connected to the work we're doing, has been an amazing partner. We launched um, Every Cure from the Clinton Global Initiative this fall, and um, since we announced, you can imagine we've been contacted by hundreds of patients and family members of patients. My child has this disease, I have this disease, can you help us? And of course, we're still building the organization, we're still fundraising to actually build out all these tools in the team. And so um, we're not there yet, but we've turned to the data that we have had donated to us. I just wanna share about Baker, the, the patient in the middle here. Um, 
Baker has a, a rare uh, immune system disorder, and we were able to dig into the data and identify a drug that's been around for years that had not been tried for him. Um, and with that medication, Baker was actually able um, to leave the ICU and actually go home to be with his family. And Baker's got a really serious condition, so we don't know what his future looks like, but we do know um, that we got him out of the ICU with a drug that was, that was already in the pharmacy, but his hospital did, didn't know to try it. And you know, I'm not supposed to be here, and I don't know how much longer I'm gonna be here, but as long as there's people like Lisa and Baker and Raj, we're gonna keep chasing after cures, but we can't do it alone. We really, really need your help, and we need you guys to join us on this mission that we're on. There's three ways you can do that. The first is fundraising to build out the team and the data engine that we've built. The second is access to more data that can go into the data engine. And third is partnerships, finding organizations like the Medibles of the world and the Medidates of the world that can come together with us to, to really push forward the science in ways that's never been done before. I just want to, this is my, my second to last slide to highlight where we are over the last 10 years. We've, spent, we've raised and spent about $10 million through my center to uncover 10 repurposing opportunities, um, which we're really proud of. Um, but in the next three years, we're at this, this inflection point through every cure um, where we're building out and scaling the artificial intelligence engine, um, which will cost another about $10 million. And then moving forward um, into the following phase will be where we'll actually be moving those promising drugs into clinical trials. Um, it costs between $1 to $5 million for every clinical trial we'll be running of drugs and new diseases. And so that'll be um, to be able to run 15 clinical trials. And to really, um, when you think about that relative to new drug development, it's less than 1% of the cost of new drug development, but really, really just incredible impact on human lives. So just going to close with a few lessons. Um, the first is that ever since I had my last rights read to me, I felt like I've been in overtime, time I didn't think that I would have, where I've tried to make the most of every second. But I really want to encourage all of you all um, to live with that same sense of overtime and, and urgency. The second is that my life changed when I went from being a hopeful person to being someone who turns my hope into action. And, and I hope you all will continue to do that as well. Third, solutions may be hiding in plain sight. The drug that I'm on that's saving my life was sitting at my neighborhood pharmacy, but no one knew to try it. How many more drugs are sitting at your pharmacy that could be life-saving for you or for someone you love? And lastly, my book is called Chasing My Cure, but we really should have called it Chasing Our Cures because it's been such a huge team effort of an army of people from around the world working together to find cures for me and for so many more people. But today, I invite all of you to be a part of that army. We need you. We hope you'll join us in Chasing Our Cures so we can create a world where no one is told we've tried everything when there's a life-saving cure on the pharmacy shelf. Thank you guys so, so much. Oh, thank you. 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 David, th thank you so much for uh, bringing hope into action. Um, I know you mentioned this briefly. Um, how can the Next Men Health community help uh, your amazing work? So. Uh Three ways. Um, one, funding. Uh, we're raising $10 million. We're about 40% of the way there. I've still got another about $6 million to go to build out the team and the engine. Um, second is through data. If you work in an organization that has healthcare data, which I think is pretty much all of you, um, there may be a way that your data could be useful for finding new uses for existing medicines. And third is partners to really move things forward so that whether it's launching a clinical trial or it's uh, establishing some other partnership, we need all hands on deck um, and, and we really can't wait any longer. In reality, almost every common disease often is really a rare disease. Like, so we can reset the sort of definition of disease and the ability to do sort of real true N of 1 medicine through exactly. the work going forward. Great. That's right. Thank, thank you, you David. so much. No, thank you so much. Oh, wait. We haven't done the... We haven't, uh, That's right. Well, we don't have, do we have a camera up here? Um, I don't, do you have a camera in your pocket? Uh, I have a camera in my pocket. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So... so so our request of all of you is that you'll stand up and we do what's called a Castleman Flex. So you saw the picture of me and President Clinton doing the Castleman Flex. So we've sort of turned the idea of a Castleman disease into like a warrior. So if you'll uh, maybe stand up and do a little Castleman Flex with us. And we all can right, get to like the world's largest Castleman Flex right now. All right, demonstrate amazing. the move okay, first. Yeah. So it's like this. this. Oh. But you have to make the noise too. It's not just like, it's like a, oh. 
awesome. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you, you all everybody. so much. Thank, thank you, David. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>